<laughs> good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this afternoon, I'm going to explore some of the themes in a bit more detail which sit behind our Global Payments Innovation Initiative. And particularly, I'm going to follow the theme line that seemed to open up this morning as well, and I, I thought that was quite interesting, that you have a set of innovations in payments, uh, whether it's domestic or cross-border, which are both technology-oriented and business process-oriented. And I think the way in which these two things come together, and it's an and relationship, not an or relationship, uh, is, is something really important as we look at all of the disruption occurring in the industry, and particularly how the industry is applying this to this innovation in the cross-border payment space. I was listening this morning and I, I picked up a few observations and things that I had just heard and um, I have the privilege of selecting the things I heard that help with the, the session here, so excuse any bias that I might have, uh, but I think they help elaborate some of the things that we're speaking about. Uh, I heard one of the speakers say, payment rails are not so bad, not so bad. Uh, at SWIFT, of course, and Eddie shared this this morning, we think the SWIFT rails are today really quite competent in doing what they are supposed to as well, and it's something of, of value to build on. So the rails are not so bad. I heard blockchain together with existing infrastructure. And I, I think in the past a year, year and a half ago, we would have heard the distributed ledger conversation of the blockchain conversation as a alternative to existing infrastructure. And so you see these two ideas coming together now as well. I heard problems on integrating, and integrating is a very big word, and I'll, I'll explore a little bit more about some of the, the business process frictions, if you like, that we're solving for within the Global Payments Innovation Initiative, and particularly based on the SWIFT rails, which help with this process of integrating and actually using things that are there, but providing these new layers of, of change and incremental value for the industry. Um, and then we also heard Danielle from FinTech Australia talking about the, frankly, you know, rapidly growing and very exciting FinTech ecosystem here in the Australia marketplace. And you'll see as well how with uh, GPI that we have a, a model and approach which really embraces the role of FinTech as well. So I'll share a bit more about that with you in a moment. The way this session will work is I'll, I'll make a quick presentation. Um, I'll share a, a short video on GPI and then I'll ask uh, four panelists to, to join me here as well and we'll have a conversation about how they're working with GPI, the types of problems that are being solved as well. To set a bit of context, uh, we're finding that technology is really questioning or potentially disrupting some of the things that we hold quite true and have held quite true, true for a long time. One is the nature of money itself, fiat currency, Australian dollar, US dollar. We heard about the digital currency initiatives that are occurring through blockchains, such as the ripples and the bitcoins. So this is a question about should money be done differently. And then there's the question of how do you record for money or record for transactions in general, financial or other. And these are two foundations which the financial industry has been built on. Um, they sit as core DNA when you start working in and thinking with the industry. And the technology is really asking, could these things, should these things be done differently because the technology allows it? And whatever your view on the different technologies, there is certainly some form of disruption occurring. I picked up this quote just uh, three, four weeks ago from the Fed Reserve. And this is from one of the governors of the, the Fed Reserve banks in the US. And what they said is that with even with all of this disruption occurring, somewhere in the mix, somewhere in the fintech financial te technology stack, banks are always present. And they're most obviously present in things like credit origination, holding deposits, providing access to payment systems, providing linkages to other 
financial institutions, most obviously as well in compliance management and all of the checks and balances that need to be done on payments. And the question for our industry is, if you are a financial institution, if you are a bank, uh, what role in the future are you happy with? Are you concerned with continuing to origin originate credit or maintain access to customer accounts? Or do you want to be something larger or to provide additional services within that space as well? Some of these things are likely to be contested over time as this digital disruption occurs. So at the start, I, I mentioned that we see this as something which is both a technology set of innovation and a business process set of innovation, and that the two belong together. Earlier this morning, uh, Eddie Haddad shared how the SWIFT network works today, or what we call the, the SWIFT rails. Uh, it's a highly connected, uh, highly extensive network in terms of reach across 11,000 institutions. We have 3,000 institutions in Asia Pacific alone connected to the SWIFT network. Every three days, the total value of world GDP passes safely and securely over the network. Importantly, the technology performs in such a way that you can pick up a payment instruction here in Sydney and place that in Paris or in New York or any part of the world, frankly, in two or three seconds. And all of this is done at a two to three euro cents per message level. And those prices, by the way, have been continuing to go down as the network grows and the reach expands and more customers use that network. So given that the technology, the network, performs very well today, what problem are we solving for in cross-border payments? And I have a little story here. China is very prominent here in Australia. We heard about the, the growth in exports uh, in the tourism industries and the education industries. A lot of that is driven by China and other, other countries. If you take the scenario of a Chinese business, and a Chinese business is exporting to a business here in Australia, you have the export process itself, and we all know that, that that is quite complicated. These days, lots of documentation, lots of, again, checks and balances, reconciliation, information handling, lots of different parties. When you come to the payment, the payment itself is quite complex. And the reason it's complex is that you have many institutions involved. And if you look at uh, a transaction here, which involves four institutions, you have for example, a regional institution such as Bendigo Bank having to settle this payment with the supplier in China. They may use a larger transacting bank, such as one of the big four banks, or perhaps one of the large global institutions, a Citibank, a HSBC, for example. The transaction needs to carry across borders into China. It may be intermediated through a correspondent such as Bank of China or ICBC. And then ultimately in China, you have nearly 10,000 financial institutions that potentially need to be reached to settle that supply with the exporter in China. All of that carries a number of different frictions or business process challenges and issues. There are fees deducted along the way. There are compliance checks and balances. There's reconciliation that needs to occur. There's very often FX transactions involved. There's documentation, some of it digitized, some of it in print form. There's liquidity needs as well. And all of that adds up to a very serious level of this business process friction. And it's this friction that we are really looking to solve with the Global Payments Innovation Initiative. If you look at that corporate in China or a corporate here in Australia, and I'll have, I'll have one of these um, organisations, Dane will join me on the panel in a moment as well, from Cochlear. The types of problems that they say they experience, so these are our customers here. The gentleman here from Roche, which is a Swiss uh, medical services firm, he wants speed for 
his critical transactions. You have a gentleman here from GE. He wants the visibility or the transparency to the fees that are deducted along the way. He wants to understand what his fee profile is for transacting around the world. This lady here for, from Viacom, the, the massive US entertainment giant organization, she wants to be able to track that payment and have the confidence and the certainty on when the money reaches her beneficiary's account. And then you have another example here, Zertus, which is a uh, veterinarian health company. They provide vaccinations for cattle uh, and uh, sheep, that, that kind of thing. He's requiring more information with the payment. So very often when a payment transaction occurs, critical information is dropped or truncated from the message and it doesn't reach the beneficiary. So there's less value in the carriage of that payment. So these are the typical types of problems that we heard from corporations when we spoke to them about how does your cross-border payment experience look today? And these are the things that we're solving for in GPI. And we do that through improving the speed of transactions. So GPI requires for all banks that are members, same day good fund payment outcomes to the end corporate. So think about that, real money in a real bank account at the end of the same day. That's what the GPI service promises. It provides transparency to the fees that are deducted along the way. So banks participating in GPI are required to provide the fee information that's deducted as well, and you'll see how that works in a moment. Uh, traceability, so for the first time a payment, like a typical physical goods transaction, a DHL or a FedEx experience will have a unique end-to-end -end tracking reference that will allow us at any point in time to understand where that payment is throughout that whole payment and supply chain. Certainty is very important, so when you speak to a corporate, uh, they're not requiring that the money is available immediately. They would like it by end of day, but more importantly, they want the certainty and the knowledge and the confidence that that does occur by end of day. And then you have the extra information requirements. So GPI requires that additional information is carried end to end through the transaction as well. Um, GPI is live today, so we are now out of the lab. So in 18 months, we've gone from conceptualizing this idea with financial institutions to building a service, testing it with institutions, piling it, it's real money to going live. So we're now out of the lab and we have something live to the point that there are over 110 banks enrolled in the initiative and 70 of those are either live or in the process of onboarding and implementing the GPI service. In Asia Pacific, there are over 20 financial institutions that are committed to onboarding the service as well, and a number of live institutions as well. So ANZ Bank is now live on the GPI service here in Australia. You have the, you have the big four banks, as I mentioned, uh, signed up to the initiative today in various stages of going live, ANZ is live, and these are a selection of the other 110 organizations around the world that are in the GPI service. You can see banks from pretty much every country in the world, and many as well of the multinational financial institutions, the, the large um, global transacting banks as well. In China, China's now Australia's largest trade partner. There are 13 banks either live or committed to go live in China, both Bank of China and ICBC are live today. Uh, it's actually of the live traffic and we're seeing hundreds of thousands, we've seen hundreds of thousands of live transactions on GPI. Uh, the US to China corridor, the inward corridor is actually the largest corridor live on GPI today. So that says something about the importance of being able to transact with the China marketplace and settle those uh, exports that China is still providing even though a little bit more slowly these days. GPI is divided into phases, and these phases actually travel in parallel, so they're not sequential. We finish one, move on to the other. Phase one is providing this faster service, same day payment outcome, the fee transparencies, the traceability through the end to end tracking reference, 
and the unaltered remittance information. All of those are live today. That's part of the service which we've introduced today. We have a second phase, which is about adding additional services on top of these, we can call them, think of them as clean rails, so less friction rails on the GPI network, adding services such as the rich payment data service, which is the ability to actually provide digitized documents that are attached through this unique tracking reference to the underlying payment information. So you think about the value of that in a trade finance and um, supply scenario there, if you can have documents which are linked up to the underlying payment, very, very powerful. You have a stop and recall payment service. So sometimes there are reasons in which a payment needs to stop. It could be suspected of fraud a fraudulent transaction, it could be a duplicated payment, or it could be quite simply your company that you're serving says, look, I didn't mean to pay on Wednesday, I meant to pay on Thursday, can I, can I recall that? So in the stop and recall payment service, again, through this unique tracking ability, we can publish the, the message request to have that payment stopped and recalled as well. And all of that's enabled through the unique end-to-end -end tracking reference. And the international payments system is designed to improve the conformity of payment instructions in markets that institutions may not be familiar with. So for example, if you're transacting in Thailand, they have a very unique set of local payment market message practice. Uh, and the payment system assistant helps such that when that credit transfer is created, it adheres to the local practice in Thailand and you're more likely to get an automated and straight through processing outcome when you make that payment as well. And then back to the, the technology side of things, we have a proof of concept occurring right now with 26 financial institutions. Uh, this, this was based off some work between ANZ and Wells Fargo, where they looked at the opportunity of a distributed ledger service to improve with, improve the process of Nostro reconciliation and to strip out some of the costs of that. We've taken that early work and we've now introduced that as a broader initiative on a, on a more global basis. And we have 26 institutions actually undertaking this proof of concept right now and we'll have results of this by October in Cybos. So the way GPI works is that you have this faster payment outcome. It's all traced through the end-to-end -end tracking. You can see it's an example of the tracking reference there as well. You have the transparency to the fees and the information is carried to the end beneficiary. And I, and I stress all of this occurs end-to-end -end in the transaction. So we're about solving the payment pain points and challenges that corporations have when they're paying each other. This is the payments tracker. And you can see this uh, traffic light system, they're all green there at the moment. Uh, you have the top left and top right, the paying corporation and the receiving corporation and the different institutions through the journey. Um, and that tracks the fees, as I mentioned, the duration that it's taken to move the transaction from one institution to another and providing that tracking on an end-to-end -end basis. The tracker is accessed either through traditional swift messaging, so again, using something that institutions are familiar with, or if you're more open banking and API-minded, the tracker can also be accessed through API technologies and through a manual means as well. This is just a little bit more detail on those additional services that sit as additional services on top of the rails. I mentioned the distributed ledger proof of concept for Nostro reconciliation. What the research shows, and this is some research from McKinsey and company, is that at least 34% uh, and another 9%, so getting close to 50%, is related to payments operations or managing Nostro liquidity positions. So about half the cost today in an international payment transaction is held within those, those areas there. And those are the two spaces that we're solving with GPI and then also through the proof of concept on distributed ledger, actually seeing whether distributed ledger can actually help remove some of those costs and make this more efficient as well. McKinsey estimates, by the way, that 
the cost of doing these international transactions probably needs to reduce in the order of about 90% going forward. So these types of technologies, if they can help take out these large chunks of, of cost and inefficiency, will go a long way to actually meeting what that market requirement or market demand is likely to be going forward. Just want to talk a little bit more about openness. Uh, you heard Danielle earlier talk about open banking. Uh, just picked up this example from Amazon and Jeff Bezos. Uh, there are many, many stories like this and there's some myths around this one, but supposedly the story goes that Jeff Bezos many years ago mandated a set of commandments for the Amazon organization. And one of those commandments or mandates was that all of the services, all of the technical infrastructures and interfaces in Amazon, when they are built from the ground up, they have to be built in a way that they're externalizable. Now that's mostly done through APIs and um, APIs are used extensively through Amazon. And when you use the Amazon service, you can feel as a customer the externalization of this uh, when you decide to buy a, a book and you see the recommendation that people who bought books like you in the past are buying books like this, you might be interested in that. Uh, and that's just one, one example. Um, so all of the services built from the ground up. And it's some of this philosophy that you know, we're seeing in our industry, both in banks and also the way we think about the introduction of new services at Swift as well. So you see openness and APIs both in the Swift Global Payments Innovation Initiative and also in the new payments platform initiative, this idea of overlays as a way of sitting on top of a core in the terminology of NPP, basic infrastructure, but overlays actually opening that set of payment rails that'll be here in Australia by the end of the year to broader sets of uh, third party payment companies, information providers, companies that provide workflow management solution as well. So this idea of openness is in the design of both of these. We have a Swift lab uh, today where we are actually running this distributed ledger proof of concept. We have an API sandbox. So I mentioned that this tracking, universal tracking database that tracks the payments end to end that can be accessible through APIs. Many of the Swift services today are more and more becoming reachable through API, APIs. So if you use, for example, the Swift reference data service that's reachable through APIs. Uh, there are APIs starting to be developed in our, in our standards work as well, so RESTful APIs in that, that context there. Um, and then when we think as well about further innovation on the GPI service, we have what's known as InnoTribe, and InnoTribe is a Swift managed organization that works with startups in the financial technology industry since 2011 we've worked with over 600 startups and taken them through this inner tribe process and here you have fintechs actually solving problems of the industry together with the industry and for the first time we'll be running a global inner tribe innovation challenge on top of the swift gpi rails so we'll hold that in in singapore in september of this year we'll have a workshop and we'll take the leading fintechs into to Cybos in Toronto and then we'll actually work with those fintechs to, to fund them firstly um, and then hopefully introduce smarter and more valuable services on top of this GPI set of rails. So it's just another way of conceptualizing the GPI service here. You can see the rails at the bottom and the layering of services and then you can see at the top this opening up to other third parties, particularly through APIs. In a corporate context, um, if you can expose, for example, the tracking reference that is attached to the payments, as well as the information that belongs to the payment or documentation, if you can expose that to an end corporation, uh, you, you can begin to sort of see the value of actually uh, improving the way that corporate treasurers, people that are managing cash, cash flow in a corporate environment, um, the types of value that can be provided to them. So a corporation, for the first time, will be able to see the liquidity coming towards them as opposed to not knowing when that 
liquidity will arrive. And as I mentioned, we'll bring this uh, GPI uh, innovation challenge to Singapore in September. So if you happen to be a, uh, a FinTech here in the room joining us today, or you're with one of the FinTech hubs, I can see uh, Andrew here. Uh, please, please come and talk to us. We'll come and talk to you as well. We really like to link in with the fintech organisations that can help some of these, these challenges that we're trying to solve for, particularly in the corporate payment experience or the trade and supply chain finance experience. So really just to, to summarise, um, transaction banking and cross-border payments uh, is not like the good old days where it was a relatively, I won't say easy, but, but a business that just did its thing. Um, really that's, that's changed and when we think about the impacts and how, how this business might look in the future and how you would be thinking about this business uh, really for you to grow, you do need to keep an eye on security and compliance um, and at SWIFT we have the customer security program as well as all of the suite of services that support um, compliance and financial crime and compliance management. You have things like the ISO standards as well, often the need to create, to connect to and interact with different financial networks. Uh, you need to be efficient at the end of the day. Uh, so things like standardization and using services such as GPI that are based on a common agreed set of service level agreements between other institutions can help you actually be more efficient and continue to strip out those frictions and those costs from your business as well. And then you need to stay ahead of the curve. Um, I think pretty much every board um, these days is asking their executive, what is our business going to look like in a few years' time? I see this coming, how are we responding to it? Are we behind, are we at, at par, are we ahead, are we leading? Uh, and some of the ways that you can do that in your industry in working with SWIFT is things like the way we're working with the new payments platform here or what we call the real-time payment services and that change to more instant payments on a domestic marketplace, the Global Payments Innovation Initiative for the cross-border sphere, the potential within new technologies such as distributed ledger technology, and then also the important role of business intelligence as well. So uh, there is lots of business intelligence on your institution which travels through the SWIFT network. You can consume all of that and feed that into the way that you actually think about growing your business, particularly in that cross-border payment space going forward as well. So I'm just going to play a short video now and then I'll ask my, my panellists to come up to, to the stage and, and join me for a conversation. So I think we've reached a very successful conclusion. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. So it's my understanding you'll fly out this evening? Yes. Are you going to do it, sir? Oh, thank you. Hey, Lawrence. Hi, Ian. Look, I know you've put a lot of work in on this, so I thought you should be the first to know. We've signed the contract. Fantastic. Does that mean that I can push the green light on this end? Hi Ian, it's Anya. We're almost complete. We also just wanted to keep you in the loop of the payment. Yep. You should see all the details in front of you now. Fantastic. Time is of the essence. The deadline for our first shipment goes out this afternoon. And we've also just sent Mr. Chnack the payment request, which is everything he needs. Yep. Looks like he's got it.
Hey guys, uh, look, I know it's getting late there. I can track your payment and keep you posted. Oh, there's no need for you to do that, Ian. Thank you. Payment is complete. We've just got access to the funds. Perfect.